It's time to talk Pittsburgh with Heather Abraham. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us for Talk Pittsburgh. I'm Heather Abraham and we are halfway through the work week and we have some really exciting guests to give you that pick me up you need. So let's talk Pittsburgh. Diet culture can be toxic, people cutting calories, skipping meals sometimes to unhealthy limits and it can wreak havoc on your mental health. The movement to help heal your mind and your body. And CSA is preparing for a huge wave of travelers this summer, but some are still traumatized from last year's delays and cancellations. What you should keep in mind before booking that flight. But first, millions of Facebook followers are eligible for a piece of a Facebook settlement, all stemming from a lawsuit accusing the company of allowing your personal information to be shared with third parties. Right now I'm joined by Shavik Doss, Hi, thank you so much for joining Hi, us. Thank you for having me. Shavik is an assistant professor at CMU's Human Computer Interaction Institute, and you're going to help walk us through what actually took place and, and what happened with this settlement, the accusations really against Facebook. Right. Um, so Facebook recently settled for $725 million, for $725 million in this class action lawsuit. Uh, the nexus sort of, 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 of this all is, if you remember back in the 2016 presidential election, uh, there was a scandal uh, associated with the company Cambridge Analytica, and that sort of started all of this. Right. Um, so Cambridge Analytica was a company that was uh, used by the by the Trump campaign to sort of target political advertisements. And where Facebook comes in is uh, there was accusations that Facebook sort of allowed for a data harvesting third party application to collect information on users without their knowledge or consent. So when you think of $725 million on its surface, it seems like a lot of money, but you're allowed everybody who has Facebook since this time period is allowed to be part of this class action lawsuit, which right. could mean a couple of bucks for me and you at the end of the day. Exactly. It's not going to amount to a whole lot after you take out sort of the legal fees. So uh, I believe the law firm has asked for about 25% of that settlement. Yeah. Um, anybody who's had an active Facebook account between the months of March 20, 2007 and December 2022, I believe, is entitled to apply and you get like a point per month of active account. And so it's not going to amount to much. So that's really interesting because even if you look at the dates alone, this is well before the election mm -hmm. and, and the, the campaign period. So it, it leads you to believe that this has been going on for quite some time. And I think that we've all kind of realized that our information is being taken little bit by little bit, right? Absolutely. So uh, yes, that, that early date, March 2007, um, as far as I know, is not particularly significant in any meaningful way in terms of like the technical realities of how lots of these large companies have been collecting data from us, oftentimes without our knowledge. Oftentimes, without our explicit consent, they would argue otherwise because you signed like the terms of conditions or whatever. Right. Or you hit oh, the, the check stuff box. that none of us read. That's right. really exactly. small and um, 20 pages long. Right, and that's right. been going on since really uh, the internet has been a thing. <laughs> so, do we have or should we have any expectation of privacy? You and I were, were talking right before the show started about how, you know, oftentimes when we're on our devices, we're alone and we kind of have this idea that what we're doing is private. Mm -hmm. But there's no sense, we should not have that sense of privacy. Absolutely. So that, that's a great observation. Um, you know, this is something that uh, we do in my lab and our own research as well. We try to make sort of this understanding of privacy concerns and security concerns more visceral. When you think about like sort of the cues we have in the real world, right? Like if you see a dark alleyway in the middle of night, you feel a little creeped out by that. You right. don't really want to go down that dark alleyway. Uh, the internet is kind of like a massive dark alleyway, uh, and but we don't have those same cues, and so we're sort of lulled into this false sense of like, oh, everything's fine here, this is happy, I'm having yeah. fun. Yeah. But you well, know, let me look up more cute pictures of dogs. Right, right, right. Everything's fine. But in the background, you know, the it, it comes back to that old economic saying of there's no such thing as a free lunch. If the thing is free that you're interacting with right now, that's got to be economically incentivized in some way. And right now, personal data is sort of a massive economic boon. So in what you do, um, you've kind of analyzed a lot of this stuff, but do you know what we are entitled to, what kind of privacy we're entitled to by law? So it's a, it's a good question. We're negotiating this as a society right now. So obviously in the U.S. we've always taken sort of more of a free market approach towards this, whereas uh, in the EU, for example, they take more of a consumer protection approach. Uh, the U.S. is gradually sorting, uh, starting to move towards this uh, sort of more consumer protection approach as well with uh, California and some other states kind of leading the way. 
Um, right now, what you can do, um, for example, if you wanted to use, uh, if you're talking about like what you as an individual can do um, uh, in terms of legal uh, options, one thing you could do is you could uh, file for sort of data deletion requests, you could file for data download requests. Um, actually, Consumer Reports is a great app permission slip that lets you do some of these things. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that that was available yeah. to do. Um, it, I mean, it's, it, it's not easy. Um, right. And so there's a lot of work you need to do to be privacy conscious, uh, which is something that we all also should change. You and you and I were also talking about this because it feels like, you know, with the inception of Facebook and then other social media apps as we've seen, it feels like it happened so fast and also it took decades to get us where we are. Yeah. But over this period of time, it seems like, you know, mm -hmm. what I what I own, the me, my mm -hmm. information is no longer mine. It's now out there. It does feel that way, and there is this property in computer security known as the barn door property, which is unfortunate. Um, the basic idea is that you know it does no good to to lock the barn door once the horse has already run out. Yeah. Um, and it sort of feels that way with our personal data as well. However, I, I I should say though that personal data is something that is easily monetizable, and it does feel like these companies have like so much information about us. But that data does have an expiry date in a, in a lot of ways, and you're, you you as a person evolve, and so even if you start being privacy conscious now. Uh, you have this opportunity to sort of escape the tendrils of surveillance capitalism, uh, so to speak. Can you tell me more about what you do at CMU? Sure. Um, so my, uh, my lab is fundamentally about how can we create systems that empower people with greater agency over their personal data online. We do, a couple, we do this in a couple of different ways. First, we sort of try to create systems that make it easier for people to be privacy conscious, mm -hmm. uh, both online and uh, you know, talking about situated sensors like cameras and microphones and all these other things. Uh, another thing we try to do is actually we try to cr uh, facilitate privacy collective action. So how do we get, you know, post Cambridge Analytica, post Equifax, Millions of people were really annoyed, right. uh, but all of that sort of collective rage kind of fizzled out into nothingness. And you can think of this as we're trying to create a system that funnels this rage into sort of one action. unified demand and action. Exactly. Yeah. That's, it's really interesting. I feel like there's so much more into this too, because like you said, it's, there are ways to do this. It takes time and it's not easy. And, you know, I'm not a privacy fundamentalist, I'm a pri privacy pragmatist. I just want people to ha be able to exercise the options uh, that are available to them in right. a way that's not like hidden or obfuscated or in some way disincentivized. You know, there, there, there's been some excellent research that has been done at CMU and other places as well to show that, you know, we really stand no chance. There are these like behavioral scientists with PhDs trying to manipulate you with every single sort of design decision online to incentivize personal data sharing and, uh, and, and such things. Uh, and so the individual has really no, uh, no ability to fight back unless we sort of gather together. I know, if I see one more ad for a new pair of pants, you know what I mean? <laughs> like I just keep, it's like somebody knows that I'm searching for pants right now, right? right. right? So I'd love, I think it would be great to actually walk through some of the steps to, to do this and to own your privacy. So I'd love to do something more with you. And thank you so much, Shavik, for coming Absolutely. on. Absolutely, thank really you for having me. Really interesting.